Welcome back to our computational astrophysics course. Uh, so we're continuing to discuss um, magnetohydrodynamics. So we've already covered kind of the basics of like what the linear solutions look like in MHD. And now just like we did with the hydrodynamics equations, I want to talk a little bit about the nonlinear behavior um, in MHD. And the, um, we want to introduce like a kind of new concept. Um, and so I'm going to demonstrate this to you and it's called um, well, let's get a pen that works. It's called flux freezing. And so essentially, um, well, where we're going to get to, flux freezing in MHD. Is we're going to see that the consequence of ideal MHD, that is where the connectivity is perfect, is we're going to have some magnetic field lines um, as follows. And essentially what happens when you have a magnetic field through your fluid, which is a gas, um, is probably the best way to think about it in astrophysics. So the magnetic field is generated by some currents. You don't, um, well, that comes from Ampere's law, um, but the currents could be a long way away from where the magnetic field um, is. So for example, the currents that generate the magnetic fields in the sun are inside the sun, uh, but the magnetic field generated by the sun is, you know, on the outside of the sun. Um, so, uh, the basic nonlinear behavior of these equations, as you're going to see, is that um, the flow is constrained to move along the field line. So the field lines are like a kind of channel. So imagine that you had a kind of very straight magnetic field here. Um, so my fluid would only be allowed to move in this channel and not cross um, the magnetic field line sideways. So basically, um, for a strong magnetic field, you would find that the fluid um, would just simply be channeled by the magnetic field. And for a weak magnetic field, the, um, the fluid would push the magnetic field lines around and the magnetic field would get tangled up by the fluid. So there's a simple way to demonstrate that from the equations of MHD. Um, and that's basically to consider um, the magnetic flux through an arbitrary surface. So I'm going to go through the standard um, geometric argument, which is the one you find in the textbooks. Um, you can also actually just do this algebraically, um, but the geometric argument is kind of nice because it helps you to sort of visualize um, what's going on a bit more. So imagine that we had some surface um, C, so just a sort of circular cross section, and we've got some magnetic field lines threading this surface. Um, so this is our surface C. It's just some area. And imagine that we've got some magnetic flux um, threading this surface. So you can imagine this surface being threaded by magnetic field lines. Um, so what's the flux? Um, so the total flux, um, we'll call this one phi, not to be confused with the gravitational potential. But the total flux is then the integral of the magnetic field uh, over that surface. Okay, over C. Um, and so therefore the change in flux, so if man, now you imagine this surface is moving or the fluid is moving through this surface, um, then imagine that we had some new um, surface, so this fluid has moved, so you've got some new surface C dash, uh, and this is some time, so some time T you have this surface and some time T plus delta T, uh, you're asking how has the flux changed uh, as this surface has moved with the fluid. Okay, so the change in flux would be a, like a delta phi, and that would be basically the flux through the new surface minus the flux through the old surface. So it's the flux through C dash, which is the magnetic field um, at some x, which is some vector position, um, and the new time, t plus delta t dot ds, minus um, the flux through the old surface, which is uh, B at X and T um, dot DS, okay, over the old surface C. So now um, we can simply, well, we're going to use a Taylor series, um, but we could also do, make a kind of geometric argument, which is basically the flux now imagine a kind of cylinder that's um, surrounding this sort of flux tube now. So the flux that's uh, through 
just by conservation of flux, the flux, any, any flux difference between what's going through this surface and what's going through this surface must simply be what's leaked out the sides, right? So if a magnetic field has gone like that, then that flux would be, um, that flux would be not going through that surface. So assuming magnetic field lines are continuous, we can make a kind of geometric argument about the sort of sheaf around the cylinder, that basically the flux through the surface at the new time must simply be the flux through the surface at the old time, uh, plus anything which is, well, minus anything which has been lost from the sides. Okay, so, um, so the flux at time uh, t plus delta t, um, so you can make this geometric argument is given by, uh, so if we're trying to calculate the, the first term here, so we're trying to calculate this term, we can simply say it's basically the flux at time t plus delta t um, dot ds. It's simply the flux through the old surface, so that's uh, v uh, x um, t uh, through the surface c. Uh, sorry, t is not a vector. Well, that'd be interesting if we had vector time. Um, dot ds. Uh, plus, we've got to integrate through the sides. Now, what does that mean? Let's just call it an integral through the sides for the moment. Um, but it's going to be the flux, the old flux, so b at um, x, uh, but it's going to be t plus delta t um, dot ds, where s is now the area of this um, kind of tube. All right, so, um, well, so this is obviously equal to the same thing. Um, but we're going to turn this side thing into a, instead of a surface integral, we're going to consider a line integral. Um, so we can consider a line integral. Now, ds, so what is the area of this tube? Now, the, the length of this side is simply going to be the velocity of the fluid times delta t. So that's that length. So the, the length, uh, so it's going to be, so the area of that is going to be that. Um, times the, well, the, the line integral around um, the surface. All right, so essentially we could replace our ds with dl uh, cross v dt, or v delta t. And so we can, uh, that will be our surface element. And we can simply um, rearrange b dot a cross b, just use our vector identity, and that'll give us a line integral um, of v cross b um, dot dl delta t. So that's just using a vector identity there. Um, okay. And therefore, um, well, this thing again simply becomes now, we can turn our line integral back into a surface integral if we want to, um, and we're going to get a curl of uh, v cross b. All right, so um, let's just make some space. Actually, let's continue over here. So therefore, what we want to know is the change in flux with respect to time, so d phi dt. So that's simply, um, it's the integral over our original surface, um, b at x t plus delta t minus b of x and t uh, divided by delta t. So that's the definition of a derivative. Um, dot ds. Now the first term here is just going to cancel um, when we subtract these two and um, we're going to be left with our line integral. So it's going to be that um, plus, uh, well so that's just our db dt uh, plus 
this thing, which we can convert back into a surface integral, which gives us the curl of uh, v cross b dot ds over c. Okay, so uh, this is the line integral around uh, c, and we're just converting that back into a surface integral, um, just using our vector identities again. Um, but we've divided by delta t, so that's where that goes. Um, so basically then, I mean, you can consider these deltas like a big DDT, so it's like a um, Lagrangian perturbation. So our d phi dt is equal to the integral of, now this is just db dt Eulerian is the top term by definition of a derivative. So that, that term becomes just db dt um, minus the curl of v cross b. Okay, um, dot ds. Okay, now obviously this is zero um, for ideal MHD. So the implications of this, um, so again, you may not, you may just want to carefully work through the details on this, um, doing the surface integral, and you can find it in the textbooks. The details are not super interesting. Um, but the proof, that, but the consequence is very interesting. Because that basically means that the flux through a surface that's moving with the fluid in ideal MHD is a conserved quantity. So in other words, the, um, so what this implies is that um, magnetic field lines are frozen Um, to the fluid. So in other words, um, I'll try and change pen again. So matter is forced to flow along magnetic field lines. Now, if you remember what we meant by ideal MHD, so ideal MHD is infinite conductivity. So this is um, never actually true in nature, um, but it can be very close to being true. Um, and if it was exactly true that the conductivity is infinite, so it's always infinite in practice, but it, um, the resistivity can be very, very small. So uh, many um, gases and ionized um, fluids in space are near perfect conductors. And in that case, they behave very closely to this ideal MHD regime. Um, so, for example, you imagine the sun, and you can see these great big filaments um, in the sun, and the material in these filaments uh, really follows the magnetic field line. So you can see these big loops in the surface of the, you know, in the corona of the sun, or the atmosphere of the sun, and you can really see the material is forced to follow this magnetic geometry. Um, and so that's what we get out of the equations of um, MHD. Um, so that's the right way to think about it is the matter is forced to follow a the magnetic field lines, if the B is strong, or um, another way to think about it is the field, um, or the B field, gets tangled by the fluid. So if you've got a weak magnetic field, and so what we mean by weak, um, I'll define in a minute, um, if uh, field is weak. So when we say um, weak or strong as determined by the plasma beta, it's meant to be a beta. So the plasma beta is simply the ratio, dimensionless variable, which is the ratio of um, magnetic pressure to gas pressure. So it's a half um, B squared on mu naught divided by the gas pressure. Uh, so P gas, let's call that. So it's the magnetic pressure divided by the gas pressure. So if B, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. It's the gas pressure divided by the, so infinite beta means um, basically hydro. So it's a P gas um, divided by a half B squared on mu naught. 
So beta equals one means your magnetic field is strong. So this is strong magnetic field. Uh, in terms of the magnetic field has the most influence and beta um, is much, much later than, greater than one would be weak. MHD or weak B field. Yep, so when we talk about weak and strong, we mean uh, considering the plasma beta, basically the ratio of gas pressure to magnetic pressure. All right, so there's a top, couple of topics um, that we need to cover still, but that's basically flux freezing in a nutshell. I'll just say one more thing about that. Um, pretty much you must hate it when I say one last thing, because it always takes ages to explain that one last thing. But if you don't like this kind of geometric argument, and I find it um, a little bit confusing sometimes, you can simply do it algebraically. Um, so an alternative uh, proof, you can simply do this algebraically. You can say that the integral of B dot ds um, is simply the integral of divergence of B um, uh, dv. So that's just your um, standard uh, Green's theorem or divergence theorem. You can turn a surface integral into a, a divergence of. Um, and then you're simply trying to show that the ddt of the integral of b dot ds um, is zero. Now, it's, it's kind of obvious that this thing has to be zero because div b is zero, but that's if it's over the total volume, right? So it depends what, um, what volume you're considering here. Um, so if it's an arbitrary volume, um, some arbitrary delta V, um, delta V here for the surface and V for the volume, um, then you want to be showing basically that um, the DDT of the integral of V div B dV equals zero. And so you can do that. Um, the way to do that is how to take the big DDT inside the volume integral is to think of this like a, like imagine it would, would be a sum like we've been using in SPH sometimes. So uh, what's, what you really need to do is a mass element and the DDT of a mass element is zero. So you need to put a density divided by a density. And so that simply becomes the DDT of div B on rho, rho DV that is equal to zero. So, um, so D flux DT has to be this. And so then you have to carry through this proof. Um, you're better off now changing this DDT into a partial DDT um, plus a V dot grad. Um, and you end up putting your DB DT equation in here. But if you follow this through, you should be able to prove algebraically what we just did in a kind of geometric proof. Um, and you can prove that this is indeed true. Um, even though it's a bit weird kind of assuming that div B is not zero, but then it is zero. Um, but if you don't assume that this term is overall zero, and you just follow the maths through, then you do get your induction equation inside the volume integral, uh, which is basically just what we got here. Um, so you can do exactly the same as that. You're gonna find a divergence of that stuff, uh, dv basically, um, and you find that that is equal to zero. Um, so it's the same proof, but you can do it algebraically instead of um, the geometric argument if you're really bored or if you have time. Okay.